Welcome to the Fit Dad Nation podcast, forging strong fathers and raising a stronger generation. It's time to get up or shut up with your host, Steve Roy. Hey guys, this is Steve Roy, host of the Fit Dad Nation podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks for listening. So uh, before I introduce today's guest, just want to take a quick moment to invite all you dads who are listening right now. If you're ready to start taking action on reclaiming your health and your fitness uh, and becoming better fathers and better men, I'd ask you to take a look at joining our free online community. The best way to do that is to head over to fitdadnation.com forward slash community and apply to our uh, free private Facebook group. So today I have uh, uh, Larry Hagner with me and uh, Larry's a busy, uh, a busy father. He's got four boys. He's an author, a speaker, an entrepreneur. He's the founder of The Good Dad Project. He's the host of the Dad Edge podcast and the Dad Edge Alliance. And he's someone that uh, I'm happy to call a friend uh, and a mentor. So, Larry, thanks so much for being here. I'm, I'm actually really excited to uh, finally be able to have this conversation with you. Oh, man, me too. I'm, I'm excited. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So... You know, you and I have been in contact, you know, many times over the last couple of years. I've been part of uh, a couple of your groups. You're doing just phenomenal work with dads, helping dads. Um, you know, I've learned a ton from you. So, you know, I want to hear, you know, I guess first off is how you even got started down this path to, you know, helping men become better fathers and better husbands and just, you know, better men in general. I woke up one day and decided that I was going to be the next expert. So that's really what it is. Like I, I, I figured it all out. I stopped making mistakes as a parent. I was completely engaged. I never yelled at my children. And uh, yeah, that, that's where it all came to be. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> End of the show. Uh, and cut. Right. Uh, you know, the the Dad Edge podcast, and the Good Dad Project, man, it – in 2012, I, I hit, I hit a pit, and just an absolute pit. Um, and I, I'll back up here and just share some of my story for for your audience that may, may or may not know. But like my childhood, uh, I was I was born in 1975, which makes me 29. And <laughs> yeah, so I was born in 1975. My parents though were married for a few years before I was born, and then after I was born, like a year later, uh, they they split up. They got divorced. And I never really knew my dad because after that he left. And I remember like literally like I, I have no recollection of my father whatsoever. He, he was gone out of my life. And I was in, I was in preschool and I remember uh, dads coming to pick up their kids. And I remember it was like, you know, it was this male figure coming to pick up their kids. And I, I knew what a dad was, but I knew that I didn't have one. But I did, it wasn't a bad thing. Like I was just like, oh, you know, I, we don't have one. I guess the moms go out and find a dad. Like literally I was four years old and that's how I remember it. Like moms go out and find dads. So the first time my mom brought home uh, a man, uh, she was working with him and he, he was white collar. You know, he worked for, he was like a data software engineer back in the, back in the day. So like 1979. So the first time she brings him home, he comes over for dinner and he's wearing like three piece suit, double Windsor tie, briefcase, trench coat, you know, uh, handlebar mustache. <laughs> yeah. So he walks in and of course I shake his hand and first and in my mind, I was like, Oh dude, she did it. Like she found me a dad. Like uh, we got a dad now. So I asked this guy that like, I was like, are you going to be my dad? And like literally man, the, the air in the room, it was like, it was just like sucked out. Right. Like super awkward. And he laughed and you know, and then he stayed for dinner. And I just remember, I, I remember having that dinner just being this little kid and suddenly just feeling like the family was complete. And a year later they got married and I was in the wedding. I was the ring bearer and they were married for six years. And what I can tell you is every year got worse. He started out as like a really nice guy. I will say this positive about him. He, he was, he was ex military. He did a great job of teaching me about manners. He was disciplinary, but he was also very kind uh, w when he was sober anyway. When he drank, it was kind of like this Jekyll and Hyde thing that came out in him. So I, I did see a lot of dark side to him. And I think looking back on it, I think my mom really felt pressure to marry him because she could tell like probably how badly I wanted a father in my life. And I don't, I don't know if she was ever really in love with him. And I think that kind of got to her over time. So they got divorced and then he left like gone. 
So at that point, I started asking more questions like, you know, I lost my father that I knew of. And that's when I really found out that I had a biological father. And when I was 12, I had an opportunity to meet him. And that was exciting, awkward, crazy, and it wasn't expected. Like I literally, it was a total fluke that I got to meet him. Um, I, I won't go into the story of the details, but I, I unexpectedly got to meet him. We spent some time together. He was remarried at the time, had a two-year-old son, another one on the way. And I remember we, we hung out and we spent time together and then it just sort of fizzled and faded. And that, that was tough, man. I'm not going to lie. That was really, really tough because I felt like, God, I lost my father once, then my stepfather, and then my biological father again. So my mom went on to marry a couple more times, dated men in between. And I always say this, like every guy that my mom dated had some sort of baggage, like some sort of toxicity, some sort of addiction with alcohol or whatever else, or mentally or physically abusive. And that was tough. So half my childhood was spent without a father figure. The other half was spent with a toxic one. And then I'll finish up with this. When I was 30, two things happened. Number one, I became a father for the first time. And that scared the crap out of me, like terrified me more than anything. Mm -hmm. And I met my biological father again. And again, total fluke. I ran into him in a coffee shop here in St. Louis. And we decided that we were going to start a relationship. And we did. And I'm happy to say here we are 14 years later. And we still have a good relationship. It's more of a it's more of a friendship. But I have two younger half brothers. I have two uh, small nephews. I have a sister in law. Uh, he's still married to the same woman. He's been married to her for forty years. This is a long answer to tell you though. Like I had a really screwed up perception of what should a father be. So I knew what a father shouldn't be, and that's what I was like. Okay, so I know I'm not going to do all these things that were done to me, but I don't know. I don't know what good looks like. I have no clue what good looks like. And it was so important for me not to screw up fatherhood. Like it was, it was like almost like I was taking a flag and staking it in the ground. Like I will not screw this up. And for six years I was screwing it up like terribly. I was, I was definitely the guy still am that, you know, that guy still comes out that we serve today. And that is, I was short on patience. I didn't know how to communicate with my wife. Intimacy between us was an issue. Um, the the marriage felt strained. Zero patience and tolerance for my kids when they acted out. And I felt like I was literally banging my head up against the wall. If I look at the five dimensions that we always focus on in the community, which is mastering your finances, uh, mastering your health, uh, having a legendary marriage, um, connection with your kids, and leader in business, the only one that I really truly felt like I was good at was leadership and business because I was thriving in my career. Everything else was a total mess. So in 2012, I really hit a low point with this. My marriage was in trouble. I was a terrible father. And I was like, something's got to change. Like something has to change. I don't know what it is. And I was too, pr too proud. My ego would not allow me to ask for help. And it finally got to the point where I was like, I need to ask for help. So I started seeking out mentors. I started the blog in 2013, gooddadproject.com. Uh, I started podcasting in 2015. And that's where I really felt like I started learning things. Because, you know, I say this all the time. I'm still a student in my podcast. And I get to have conversations with people who are much smarter than me. So I get to learn from them. And then the audience gets to learn right along with me. And I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for what I'm, what we're doing with the podcast. And I say that humbly because every day it's, I've ra I'm raising four boys. Every day is, is enjoyable, mad chaos and out of balance. So that's my story. Uh, something else. Um, you know, it's, it's almost, it's hard for me to envision you, you know, as a bad father, since, you know, you're known in the community as, you know, the God that's all about fatherhood and you're, and you're sharing lessons and you've done hundreds of podcasts on the, on the subject. And that's interesting. Um, and it just was making me think of my own childhood. My parents divorced when I was six. My father stayed in LA. My mother took us to New Hampshire, my brother and I. I only saw him every summer f until I was 18. And I didn't, you know, there was no discipline. There was no real, I won't even call it fatherhood. It was going to baseball games, playing sports. 
and going to theme parks. Like there was never a need to discipline us because we were basically on vacation, you know, all summer. And, um, you know, I vowed that I wouldn't be that type of father. And I, well, first of all, I vowed that I wouldn't put my kids in a similar situation and um, end up divorced, especially with young kids. And that's exactly what happened. My kids were almost the exact same age as my brother and I were when my parents divorced, which may or may not be a coincidence. But um, yeah, so, you know, but I, I said, I'm not going to be that dad that just is, you know, taking them to ball games and, you know, not really truly involved. And that's been my main commitment, you know, because I have my kids. We've I've been divorced now for or separated for, for, for and divorced for seven years about. And I custody schedule is still the same. We, I have them every single weekend, but, you know, it's never enough. So I could easily just be the dad that, you know, takes them out, you know, buys them stuff and has fun and nothing else. But, you know, I've spent countless hours talking with them and trying to teach them, you know, right from wrong. And um, yeah, so that's, that's been, you know, just like with you. I mean, just I, that wasn't going to happen. You know, I mean, not that, that my, my father wasn't a bad father. He just didn't have to step into that role. My mother, you know, raised us by herself and made all the hard decisions and put us through school and all that stuff. So, yeah, so that, that story kind of hits home, but, um, yeah. So, you know, there's, man, there's so much that you and I could talk about. Can I comment on something just real quick? Of course. course. I, I think, I think your story, my story, it's, I think it's actually more common than not. You know, I, I, every guy I talk to, I mean, I can count on one hand, I think out of the, actually, I got, gosh, it's probably, I actually, I calculated it up the other day, um, how much time I have spent with, uh, w- with interacting, coaching men and, and that kind of thing over the past seven years. I can't remember what it was, but it, it was up to like, it, it was just shy of like 5,000 hours. And one, I can, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I can count, I count on one hand how many guys can say, uh, I, my dad was awesome. I don't have any wounds from him. Like he was like, I'm trying to be like him. I think every guy, every, every guy, every woman probably too, there's some sort of fatherhood wound, but you know, here's the thing. Our dads didn't have the resources, the platform, the communication, even the, the permission that I think guys are Mm -hmm. given today to go out and and try to do this thing better than what what we had. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I sit there and I think I'm like, man, if, if our dads had what we had today, like what would that look like? And I think it would I think it would look totally different. I think I think our dads for the most part, they kind of did the best job mm-hmm. with what they had, you know, and, and they didn't know what they were doing. We don't know what we're doing and we still have all the resources in the world. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. I mean for example, my father, when my mother left, she said I'm taking the kids and you know, back then this was 40 years ago. Uh, you know, I'm 48 now. So 42 years ago, the system, the legal system was was di- was a lot different and, and more so skewed towards the the mother, right? So he didn't have a lot of rights. He didn't have any money to fight for custody, and so yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes they look at it and be like, "How the hell could you just let us go?" And then you have to think about the situation. Like literally, we went, we went to see him in in the in the um, summertime back in the early days. He didn't even have a place to live. He was living in his office and we were sleeping in his cabinet drawers. Like that's, we had nothing. And so I think about that, you know, eventually he ended up becoming a a professor and researcher at UCLA and he spent 40 years there as his career and he did really well for himself. But in the beginning, yeah, he had, he had nothing. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, his heart was broken when he lost his boys. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. But he, he, you know, he was in Vietnam. He, he hardened up a lot. And um, yeah, so yeah, that's my, you know, I've heard you talk about this a lot, vulnerability. And he, he's not, he's never been a vulnerable guy. Just maybe it's from the scars from Vietnam, being drafted and put in the front lines and getting injured and all that other stuff. But yeah, that's, that's something that, you know, I, I really struggle with myself, but I, I make it a point to try to overcome that being vulnerable in front of the kids. I mean, you have two young girls, you know, you think, oh, they need to be strong and blah, blah. But, you know, uh, the, there's so much strength in being able to be vulnerable, not the other way around. So, yeah. Authenticity equals strength. It does. 
Yeah. And, and the best gift you can give somebody, <clears throat> even your kids, is your true self. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I, I don't know many dads that are willing to let themselves, like, for example, break down and, and be emotional or cry in front of their children, you know, because maybe we just don't think that's something we should do. Happened for the very first time to me last month with my 14-year-old. You know, I was having a very important conversation about lying. She had been lying a lot, and I had a long conversation about what's going to happen if she continues down that path, and I, I broke down. I don't. I think she was more stunned than anything. Oh, holy shit! What is dad's crying? I, I don't ever. I've never seen that. You know, and it was it was uncomfortable for me, but I just I couldn't control it, and I just didn't try to. So you know, it happened. But yeah. Um, so yeah. So anyway, that, you know, there's. There's a lot that we could talk about, and, and I'm hoping that at some point we can do a follow-up show because there's just no possible way to, to cover all yeah. the things I'd like to talk about um, in this show. But, um, you know, one thing that I've seen over the years, and I've been, I've been coaching for a long time, 22 years as a trainer and a coach, um, you know, I've seen a lot of successes, a lot of failures, a lot of excuses. You know, I've heard it all. And lately, in the last, let's even say, three or four years, I've just noticed one of the biggest differences between someone succeeding with their health and, and not, it's not, you know, the, the workout programs, it's not the diet, it's not the information, you know, there's more information out there than ever before. It's having the support, having a support system. Um, and so... You know, when I look at you, I, I look at somebody that's created, you know, such a, a strong brotherhood and tribe in your groups because I've been part of them. Even some of your, you know, your um, your paid masterminds, and uh, it's phenomenal looking at the interaction in there and the brotherhood and the camaraderie and the friendships. Um, and so I've seen that as uh, the difference maker, whether or not a guy will flourish or or just wither and die and so that's what i want to uh, talk to you about because my goal is to get as many men involved in what we're doing our mission you know becoming better fathers better men better husbands through physical health mental health getting stronger you know physically mentally and then allowing things to just progress from there and i've seen it play out over and over it, it happened exactly like that in my own life um and so you know, I want to kind of get into some of the things and what you've learned. I mean, you, in my, you know, my opinion, you're an expert when it comes to this. You know what makes men tick. And that's incredibly powerful because, you know, the more men we can inspire to get involved, whether it's, you know, your group or my group or another group or another tribe, whatever, you know, that's that's where a lot of this, this is happening. And so, you know... Yeah, I want to get your thoughts on, you know, some of the things that make this all work. I mean, you've been doing this a long time and, and you know, you know, I guess maybe my first question is, you know, what are a couple of things that you've seen as a kind of common denominator that work across the board as far as uh, your groups? Like what are the what are the key, you know, factors in a group that, that make it thrive and make men want to get engaged and do better and be better? That's, that's a good question. And with my experience with all this, and it's been a learning experience. I mean, this whole thing has been nothing more than a total learning experience of what is it that separates the man who actually executes in his life and the ones who don't. And the, the one thing that I can tell you is most men are on the drift. That's what we call it, the drift, which it's that wash, rinse, repeat cycle. Every day feels like Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. You have your coffee, you go to work, usually you're driving to a job that you do not like. 82% mm -hmm. of US, um, US employees are completely disengaged with their company. So eight out of 10 people are driving to a job that they don't even really want to be at. But they most men feel trapped because they are the provider. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are bringing home the paycheck. So got to do something, right? Yep. And of course, what we do is we, we, um, 
we allow ourselves to fall on the sword of, of unfulfillment, living a life without purpose, because we feel that that's what we should do. So that's, that's our careers. That's business. Mm -hmm. When it comes to marriage, uh, 50% divorce rate in America, the ones that stay together, 30% of marriages that actually stay together can actually deem themselves as thriving and happy. Another 30% is happy enough not to break up, but they're just kind of sort of roommates, maybe get intimate every once in a while, but kind of just spinning in different orbits and in that drift. And then another 30% that stay together, the final 30%, they're, they're miserable, but they will not get divorced for some reason, whether that be finances, kids, or whatever. When it comes to the connection with our kids, hardly any of us have that figured out. We, we just don't know how to connect to our kids. And when we're going to a job that we hate all day long that drains us, we're not being that person that shows up for them big time and we, we sort of decompress, we disengage, we're on our phones, we're, on, we're, on, we're watching TV. We're not even really there. Mm -hmm. And that, the other thing too, and you see this all the time, is when it comes to our health, the first thing a man will sacrifice is his own physical well-being and yes. mental and emotional as well because when, when, you're going when you're living a life like that, now you're isolating because you're kind of miserable, but you don't want anyone to see that. That's why our two favorite answers to every question is good and fine. <laughs> yeah. Fine and fine and good. Yep. You know what fine stands for? Uh, Fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. So the next time one of your clients says, I am fine, <laughs> you know what he actually means. Okay. Right? Now yep. I'm not saying I'm not saying that every man has a miserable life. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is most men are living like this lone wolf syndrome to where we, we and, and for some, rightfully so, we take pride in that because we don't know actually what happened. We view the lone wolf as strong, right? The lone wolf is strong. Two things happen, two things happen to the lone wolf. Number one, he's lost his pack and he's going to die because the strength is in the pack. Yep. Or he's sick dying and he's going off on his own to die because that's what lone wolves do. They go off on their own to die. So they're going to die without their pack or they've gone off on their own to die. Either way, it's not a happy ending for the lone wolf. However, for some reason, if you don't know that story of the lone wolf, most men take a lot of pride in being like, I'm the lone wolf. But yep. what you're really saying is you're dying. That's really what it is. So you look at the, you look at the common man who, and here's the, here's the, here's the compliment though to men. Okay. The compliment to men is I don't, I don't know hardly any guy out there that wants to live that life. They, they really don't, but they don't know how to unlock it. They don't know the resources. They don't know the roadmap. I, I, I hate the, I hate the, the thing that the stamp that's put on men that we never stop and ask for directions. Mm -hmm. I'm the, I'm the first guy when I walk into a store, whether it be Lowe's or Home Depot, I am not going to walk up and down those aisles right. to find the drill that I'm looking for. I go, I mean, I walk through the door, I go right up to the customer counter and I say, Hey, where can I find the drills? Cause I do not want to waste my time and frustration and patience looking for something. Give me the roadmap and I'll follow it. Give me the keys, give me the solutions and I'll go get it. Yep. And that's the way most men are wired. The problem is, is that we don't check our egos. We think it's weakness. We think it, it's not showing strength if we have to ask for help. And that's why we live like this life of isolation. I can, I can, dude, I can tell you, I can tell you right now, you, your listeners, everybody else that when you go to watch one of your kids' baseball games or, or your, your daughter's gymnastics meets or your daughter's dance recital or your kid's football game, every man that you're sitting in those stands with shoulder to shoulder, they are living that life that we are talking about right now. But none of you, none of us are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Hey man, hey man, how's work? Good, good. Everything's good. Yep. And what, what'd you do last weekend? Oh, you know, we went to a football game. We did. Everybody's good. Family's good. Your wife's doing great. Yeah. Everything is fine. Good and good and fine. So we live this life of isolation. What I can tell you is that isolation is the enemy of excellence. We say that all the time. If you want to thrive, you've got to be in a in a in a group. You've got to be in a pack. Because there are, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll share with you several reasons why. When you are surrounded by, and the key here is like-minded men, 
like-minded men, Mm -hmm. men who are hungry, men who are humble, men who have emotional intelligence, men who have the mentality of iron sharpens iron, and they're going to tell you, you know, they're going to direct you, they're going to course correct because they care. They're not going to watch you watch you and your life fall apart and enable and enable that to happen. They're going to be like, Hey man, have you thought of this? Or have you thought of that? Or have you thought about talking to your wife this way? Or have you talked, have you thought about connecting with your kid in this certain way? So to answer your question is you've got to give men a platform and a community where they can have these conversations and it's okay and encouraged. And it's amazing what happens when you contribute to a community like that. Cause when you do that, you are going to learn from someone else's mistakes. You're going to learn from someone else's strengths. And guess what? The other thing too is we, we have a deep need for as men at, to be significant. To There's nothing, there's no greater compliment than when a man looks at you and be like, dude, you changed my life. I sat down with you and I was a financial mess and I got to pick your brain and ask many questions and I got to get really authentic about what my financial situation was. You helped me course correct and think about things and finances quite a bit differently. And because of you, I was able to turn my finances around. Things like that. You hear it all the time with men and their health. You know, because of you, I was able to lose 30 pounds. I was able to reduce my cholesterol levels. I was able to feel better. I was able to have more confidence in the bedroom. I was able to go outside and play with my kids because of you. And that's what men in a community like this will do. So it's that iron sharpens iron mentality. And if you really want to know what makes men tick is help us help each other navigate those five dimensions. Help us navigate our finances, our health, our marriages, the connection with our kids and our business. When we have open and better conversations like that, that's when amazing things happen. Yeah, man. You said something um, earlier about you know uh, the average dad, the first thing to go is their physical mental health, right? Emotional health. So this is something that, I talk about all the time because that's exactly what I've seen. I mean, that is that is it. Almost every guy that's struggling has put themselves last. And, you know, I've made it my mission to say, listen, if you don't put yourself first, you, the rest of your, your life is going to struggle. I said, you're going to think it's selfish. I get it. You know, that's how we're wired. A lot of us are want to be martyrs. Or like we sacrifice our entire lives, our happiness, everything for the sake of the family, for our career, for our bills. I said, fuck that. You're killing yourself. I did it for a very long time. I was miserable, really miserable in my home life, in my work life. I mean, I, I was a miserable person. Um, and so now, yeah, I teach, you know, make yourself number one and the rest will follow, you know. Start taking care of yourself. You're going to be a better husband. You're going to be a more engaged father. You're going to have more energy to play with your kids. You know, all those things are going to get better, but you have to make time for you because, I mean, you've heard it a million times too. I don't have enough time to do all that. I can't, I can't, you know, go to the gym. I can't exercise. I can't meal prep. I can't, you know, I don't have time. Yes, of course you have time. You just, you know, it's a matter of your priorities ultimately, but, you know, you have to put yourself, number one, things will get better. I couldn't agree more. And the the longer I do this mission and the longer that I see men thrive when they do invest in themselves. And I'm talking about like, go out and buy a book, go out and spend $10 on a book and read for 15 minutes a day. Do something to pour into yourself. What I always, I, I boldly challenge men now when I, when I interact with them, I don't have time to do that. Well, let me tell you something. I I don't tell them anything first. I actually ask them something. How are things right now? Well, they're terrible, you know, and and I'm trying to get better. Well, what is it going to look like if things are going the exact same way that they are one year from today? What is your marriage going to look like? What is your finances going to look like? What is the connection with your kids going to look like? If you keep doing the same thing every day saying you don't have time to do something, Well, that's when I push back and I say, well, guess what? You don't have time to not do this. You know, there's a, there's a cost for everything that we do, whether it's money or time, money or time. To me, time is more valuable than money. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you really think about it, let me ask you this question and your audience, you can think about this one. If you had the opportunity to switch places with a 90 year old man for a hundred million dollars or 
you could stay the same age you are right now, not not switch places, and just go about your life the way it is now, which one would you pick? Yeah, I think it's a pretty obvious choice. From for, I would think that it would be an obvious choice to stay where you're at. Exactly. So that that right there proves mm-hmm. that time is more valuable than money. Sure. So for me, if I'm going to invest time, whether that be listening to a podcast, listening to an audio book, uh, going to a counselor, joining a mastermind, uh, paying someone, paying a coach to help me, um, yes, there is a transaction of money, but the most precious thing that you can you can take from a man, especially a family man, is his time. But I always I always tell guys this, like if this is really important to you, you don't have time not to. There's a cost that's associated with everything. So which one are you going to pick? Is it going to cost you time and money now or is it going to cost you your relationship later? You pick. Mm-hmm. But 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 one of them is going to happen. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a good point. And, and I think about that all the time. That's by far the most valuable commodity we have. Um, you know, and... and you know when I when I've you know I've seen your business I've seen how you conduct business I've been in your groups and you know it's clear that you and I are very similar in a way that you know we view this as a people business not a numbers business a lot of people view this as numbers it's all about the numbers 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 how do we convert how do we make more money how do we make more sales I mean you're about as far away from a, a typical salesman as I've ever seen but you're thriving and it's because you're putting people first and you know I think one thing that you understand is how to motivate a man or a dad to take action you know and that's that's a bit that's a big thing i mean i you know i won't lie i struggle that's one of my biggest struggles in my own business is how do you motivate a guy to take the next step you know i mean i put out a shitload of content i try to help as many guys as i can um and, and, you know, yet yeah, you've seen it before. I mean, uh, there's a very large percentage of men that won't take a step. You know, they're, they're not going to invest in themselves. They're not going to even return the email and tell you their story. And, you know, that is extremely frustrating for me. And you're probably, you know, have a much better understanding of why. Like, why, like I, I seriously cannot wrap, wrap my head around why a guy would, let's say, for example, join my group. He has to answer some questions to get in. A lot of times they share their their mini stories of, yeah, this is really important to me. This is why I want to be fit. This is what's going on in my life. And then they they disappear. You can't get them to post. They won't answer a question. They don't do anything, nothing. And I'm like, well, why? Wh- what is missing that is is not letting this person feel whatever comfortable enough or whatever whatever it is to to share because ultimately that's my problem because I can't help them you know and I can't help them if they're disengaged and so I mean I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know how do you, how do you elicit that response of of getting somebody out of their shell or you know maybe you know if it's if they're embarrassed maybe they don't feel like they have something to offer um you know, whatever it is. I mean, there's something holding them back from saying, guys, I'm brand new to the group. I'm a fat motherfucker. I need help. Let's do this. Like that's, to me, that would be the best post, right? Because they're going to get a bunch of responses. I'm going to be in there helping them. And that's going to be, you put your pat, put your ass on the line. That's how you get results. But very rarely is that happening. And, you know, maybe it's my fault for not creating the forum for that. I, I don't know. But I want to hear your thoughts on on that, that subject. I personally, I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes with this, right? And when something is really important to you, as I humbly, you know, if you're viewed as the expert, right? I view you as a health expert, right? Mm-hmm. Some people view me as this expert. I, I don't know. I don't know why, because I, I still view myself as a student, but I do view myself as a guide, as a, as a guide to help a man become the hero of his own life. What I can tell you is, People in general don't like to be pushed. Uh, people gravitate towards being pulled. I think about the movie The Matrix, the relationship that Morpheus and Neo had. Mm-hmm. Uh, Morpheus, that's like all that dude wanted in in his entire life was to find the one. Mm-hmm. Like that was his mission. That was his purpose. That is like why that man was living was to find the one. Right. 
and he found Neo. Now, he could have shoved that message down his throat of why Neo was the one, right? Mm -hmm. You need to do this. You need to do that. You Come on. You can't. But instead, if you look at Morpheus' style, Morpheus was a guide. Morpheus even said, I can show you the door, but you have to be willing to walk through it. That is the same thing that when we are working with people and the way I view it is some guys are ready to walk through that door and some guys aren't and that's okay because that door is always there when they want to walk through it. They may, they might just not be ready and that's totally okay. I think one of the worst things we can do is, as guides, as experts, as coaches is, is to push someone into a position where they're not ready. I think what we need to do and what we do well is we, we show people their blind spots because when people are emotionally in their situations, they can't see the front door. <laughs> they can't see the door because they're blinded by all the emotion. So I think as, as guides, as coaches, the best thing you can do is meet that person where they're at on their journey. If they're not ready to step into that, there's nothing that we say or do and no matter how bad, because you're the type of person, so am I, where you, you desperately want to help people because you know what it's like to, you know what it's like to walk in those shoes and you know the keys to get out of that. Same thing with me. And I always tell guys, I get 98% of what I do, I love it. And 2% is getting kicked in the balls. And people are just like, well, what kicks you in the balls? I was like, the thing that kills me the most is when I see a man give up on himself. Like we had a guy leave the, the Dadage Alliance Mastermind community. Um, it was probably a month ago. He was there for 30 days. I can't even remember last time somebody quit in 30 days. The turnover rate's really low. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to this guy. I'm like, hey, man, I saw that you canceled and you you just got here. Like, are, is everything okay? And he's like, I'm sorry, man. Um, being around everyone in the alliance made me more keenly aware of how I'm failing and everything else. Hmm. And I was like, I was blown away by that. Because if you look at what we do in that community, it's nothing but sometimes, for lack of a better word, a shit show. Where guys are, yeah, we, we talk about where we're winning because we talk about where we're winning because we want to replicate that. You know, the best way you can contribute is like, hey, man, did you just turn around something in your marriage? Because if you did, please tell us mm-hmm. and tell us how you did it so we can do it. Um, and at the same time, you'll see a guy posting and asking, guys, my marriage is a shit show right now. I don't know what to do. So I think th- to answer your question, bringing it back to the person that you're trying to help, they have to really have the mindset that they're ready for help and there's no shame because I think a lot of times when you, you mentioned men shut down, they go away, they go quiet. I think a lot of that has to do with shame and guilt. And when you're, when all, all someone has to do, and it doesn't matter if you're a guy, it doesn't matter if you're a girl, it doesn't matter if you're a teen or a kid or whatever, all you have to do is open up your Instagram and you, you can feel like total shit about your day. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you can have a, a hundred things go, go right that day but you see somebody else balling on Instagram, you're like, oh God, I really suck. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. So that, that's how I answer that question. Okay. And it, in regards to, to the guy that left your group, um, you know, when I was part of your, your group um, and I was there for quite a while, I mean, it's a great experience. A lot of guys sharing, a lot of authentic sharing, which is what, what you want. But I, you know, I, I kind of felt the same way in the fact that there are a lot of superstars in there, you know, like, Andy Storch, you know, guys that are fucking killing it. John Bauer, you know, guys that have made massive transitions and they're, you know, just beaming positivity and success. Uh, and so I could see how, you know, someone may come in and be like, holy shit, these guys are studs. Like, I'm, I'm nothing I, and I don't belong here type of thing. And, you know, same in my group. I've got a few guys that are rock stars. They're posting every day of them on the floor, sweating their asses off. And then I have guys in the group that are 350 pounds that can't do anything. And they're probably thinking, fuck, what am I, you know, what am I doing here? This guy is doing 100 burpees and man makers and doing, and I can't even do one push up. And so, you know, that's a, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And like, you know, I'm sure as you do, I mean, I just try my best to let, meet the let guy me, where me, he's at. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, that's meet, meet him where they're at. Yeah, and the other thing, too, man, is, and not to cut you off, but there, there's one quote 
that we all need to remember because we all get caught up in it. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. You know, you mentioned a handful of guys who are in our group and you mentioned guys who are in your group and how they're just like, you know, 100 man makers, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know what? For, For every win that a guy posts or every win that we share, guess what? There's something going on that is a total shit show in that guy's life. You know, right now, podcast is going phenomenal. I was just surprisingly, the podcast was just featured in Men's Health Magazine. So like we got all these great things happening. And what people don't see is like, I'm ready to pull my hair out and go crazy with my 11 year old. Like he is testing these limits like no other. And I feel like an absolute defeated failure sometimes every damn day. So as much as we post like, hey, these are the great things going on. And that's great. There, that does not mean that we are free from challenges. We always are going to have challenges. Yeah. I mean, it's a powerful quote you just said. And, you know, to be honest, you know, I, that's something that I fight with as well, being envious. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, for those of you guys that are listening, I'm on um, video here with Larry. He's got his little, little man there in front of the mic. What's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Uh, this is Colton. He Colton. is my three. He's my three year old. He's not in school yet. So every now and again, if my door is not locked yeah, he, and he, see, he sees, yeah, man, he sees me on the mic and he's like, oh, dad's talking to somebody. He wants to come in and say hi. So he's a big dude, isn't he? He looks like a big three year old. No, man, he's a peanut. Like he? he's, he's 22 pounds. He's very small. Oh, okay. I can only see <laughs> a little bit of him. Okay. Man, that's funny. Um, so anyway, I was saying, you know, I find myself in a position because like you said social media you know we're seeing a snapshot especially instagram and i'm you know someone that is constantly trying to build a business i mean every day as you know i mean every day is it's a grind i mean i love it i absolutely love it but it's a ton of work but i love it but i find myself comparing all the time and you know specifically with someone like you you know because i've seen your business i've seen how you're helping men where we have a lot of overlap in what we're doing and I've seen the growth and, you know, it's hard not to compare. Like, oh no, why don't I have 350 dudes in my group? You know, I should be helping that many guys. And, you know, you start questioning yourself, like, what am I doing wrong? Am I not good enough to lead or coach these guys? Or how am I, you know, why am I failing when others are succeeding? You know, why is Ryan Mickler's group growing 15 times faster than mine? You know, what's he, what does he have that I don't? You know, those are all the conversations and this just, just for everybody. Every man, I'm sure, compares themselves to somebody in some aspect, whether it's fitness or you know their marriage or anything. So yeah, I mean, I, w- w- without a doubt, right? Without a doubt. Again, that's where we kind of need to check ourselves, right? I mean, because here's the thing, um, you know, the, the people that you mes- mentioned, you have you have 50 members, right? And, and 40 to 50 members. I remember when we had 50 members. You know it. I, uh, I was having a, I had Mark Devine on, mm-hmm. uh, former commander in the Navy SEALs. And he said something so profound about comparison because SEALs, you know, they're, they're, they're alpha males. They're highly competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they want to tear each other up and SEALs can really come down on themselves for not being able to perform at an elite level. And what, what, um, what, uh, Mark said is, and he says this all the time. If you listen to his podcast, every SEAL starts with one push up. No seal goes balls out and does a hundred push-ups in three minutes. You know they they train for that. They start some. We all start somewhere. If you're a marathon runner, at some point in time you were running a mile. You know if if you're growing a business, at some point in time you weren't profitable. Mm-hmm. You know, and if if you're trying to grow a community or even if you open a gym like a brick and mortar gym, at some point in time you had two members. You know, Gold's Gym at some point in time, mm-hmm. maybe only maybe only had Arnold Schwarzenegger and Franco Colombo as members. You know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's a, it, basically what I'm saying is, is everybody, everybody balling. I mean, even like, um, you know, a good friend of mine here in St. Louis, uh, Andy Frisella, who's mm-hmm. who is M- MF CEO and owner of First Form. Um, he's got an incredible story. He runs o- a over 100 million dollar business. You know, per year. I think it's way above that now. Mm-hmm. Um, he when he first opened his first supplement superstore, and I remember meeting him when he opened up that location because he was working there. Uh, this was 18 years ago, I think. 
and the guy was sleeping <laughs> in his office in the back and it wasn't even a bed it was a mattress on the floor <laughs> Because he was only making about $200 a month. <laughs> and so he started out one location, $200 a month in profit, sleeping on a mattress on the floor in his office. So everybody starts somewhere. Yeah, yeah. We got to keep that. And we got to keep that in mind, right? It's hard. I mean, I know it. You know, most of us know it. It holds me back in business. And, and I'm sure it holds men back with their fitness. You know, like, it, I mean, it happens all the time. I, I'm sure you you face this in your groups too with guys that are out of shape and they're joining, you know, to get back into shape as part of it. But guys that are, you know, have been done nothing or very little in the last 20, 25 years, they're, you know, 50 pounds overweight. Um, And then, yeah, they're like, well, I'll never be able to do it. You know, it's just, it's too much. You yeah. know, and, and you have to remind them. This is this is where it starts, right? You start with baby steps. Five minutes, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it starts with it starts with something. Yeah, man. You know, you 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 don't start you don't start running before you walk. You know, walk a mile before you try to run a mile. You know, a lot of people underestimate that. I I'll, I kind of close with this final story. When I was in college, I trained this guy. Who, I was a trainer in college, and I worked at a gym, and I was training this guy who weighed four hundred and eighty pounds. And he came in on a chair, a wheelchair, because he couldn't walk yet. Um, our goal was to get him to walk 25 feet, <laughs> you know, yeah. by, by, the, by the end of the first two weeks. And then we worked with him. It was me and another trainer, because it took two of us to work with him. Um, by the end of two months, he was walking a mile. And he did it really slow. Mm -hmm. But he st our first goal was 25 feet out of his wheelchair. And it was, you know, to see that guy, I mean, and he was an older guy, I mean, and to see that man with all that heart and all that soul, like push himself, even when it was horrible for him and he felt humiliated, but everyone's, dude, everybody's got to start somewhere. That's just what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been awesome, man. You know, like I said, I hope we can do a follow up sometime and I'll, uh, I'll put links to uh, all your stuff so people can find you, listen to your show, which is awesome, uh, in the show notes. And uh, hopefully we do this again soon. That'd be great, man. And what I will tell your audience, for those of you guys who don't know Steve personally or have never been exposed to his program, uh, by all means, this is Steve's heart and soul. You guys are blessed to have him as a leader and as a host of this podcast. Uh, I don't think you'll find any anybody on the planet that cares more for his people than him. So make sure that if, it, if this is something you want to do, if you're ready to invest in your health, man, reach out to this guy. Reach out to this guy. You Give yourself that gift of investing in you and and be with a coach that cares about you like he does. Thanks, man. He didn't he he didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> Not much anyway. Yeah, no, I <laughs> I appreciate that, man. And yeah, uh yeah, man. we'll uh we'll talk soon. All right, man. Talk soon. All right, thanks, brother. Thanks for joining us. And remember, if you want more information, check out the Fit Dad Base Camp group on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by fitdadnation.com. Until next time, keep kicking ass and taking the next step. You can do this, Dad. <laughs>